So hello and welcome um, to the second panel in our series, um, Elevating, Elevating Black Design Voices. Um, some, some of you may have come to our first panel or might be joining us for the first time. Thanks to all of you for being here. Um, for those that um, are joining us for the first time, just quickly give you some background on our organization um, in the series. Uh, my name is Gina Gray. I am the current president of the board of directors of the University and College Designers Association, UCDA, who is um, hosting this event. I'm an also, also an art director at the University of Dayton in Dayton, Ohio. Um, if you aren't familiar, UCDA is a professional organization for creatives working in higher ed. We provide programming and professional development opportunities for both staff designers and design educators. This series, Elevating, Elevating Black De Design Voices, um, it was born from a desire to support and learn about what it means to be a black designer. Uh, we wanted to provide a platform for discussions, some of which may be hard, um, surrounding this unique experience. We also wanted to showcase the amazing work that is being done and also support the professional development of this audience. Um, in the chat window, in a second, I'm going to, um, I'm going to share a link of, um, excuse me, I'm gonna share a link of our, um, we launched a site that, that houses, there's an umbrella site that houses these panels. Um, and then our new professional de development scholarship is listed on there and a designer showcase. So please share with anybody that you think might be interested um, we, um, but without further ado, I want to go ahead and get the panel started since we don't have that much time. Um, our moderator, Pierre Bowens, um, he was having some technical difficulties. So, um, he usually, um, introduces himself and then the panelists will go ahead and introduce themselves. But since Pierre's still having, uh, technical diff difficulties, if every, all the panelists could go ahead and introduce themselves. Um, so let's see, why don't, Anne, why don't you go ahead and start? Uh, my name is Ann Berry. Hi everyone. I teach graphic design at Cleveland State University in Cleveland, Ohio. Justin, why don't you go next? Hi, my name is Justin Foster. I'm currently a freelance designer here in Atlanta, Georgia. I graduated from Auburn University. Um, in 2011 with a BFA in graphic design and I'm just honored and excited to be here. Ashley. Hello everyone. Uh, I too am excited to be here. I am uh, representing uh, UNC Greensboro um, where I am an associate director, I'm sorry, assistant director um, for communications and outreach and marketing. Um, I graduated from North Carolina a t State University, go Aggies, um, back in 2002 and hope to enjoy this conversation. Great, and Sean. Hey everybody, uh, my name is Sean Payne. I'm the Executive Director for PR and Marketing at Ogeechee Technical College uh, here in Southeast Georgia, uh, Statesboro. I was a 2008 graduate of Georgia Southern University where I worked um, as a graphic designer um, and communications officer for about eight years before I came here. Great. Um, so also just want to let you know just to make sure and I think everybody's already doing that mute and mute your microphones and if you have questions or anything you can submit them in the chat window um, but due to the time we might not be able to get to all of them but if you have conversations or want to share something um, please share it in the, the chat window um, we um, will be sharing that as well as the, the recorded chat the recorded um, video afterwards so in case there's good links that you need if somebody puts it there that will be shared afterward um, okay, so I'm going to go ahead, <laughs> I will go ahead and start the first question, um, while Pierre's getting, um, situated. Um, so how has, um, if you have an institute, if you're working at a school, how has your institution been successful in recruiting or retaining minority students, or do you know of any institution doing this successfully? I guess I'll, I'll start. I can't, I can't actually speak very well to this particular question because I, I'm, as a faculty member, there's a lot about that that I don't have control over. But what I would say is um, that I think um, as an educator within my program that we, um, 
you know, being a state school, being in an urban, being an urban institution that we really try to support our students um, and whatever their needs are. And so, you know, we, we know that design, there aren't a lot of us, uh, those of us who are identified as black, African American. And so when those students come through, I think we just do our best to, to ensure that they, as well as their classmates are getting a really good experience. Um, but I, that, that's a very sort of, I guess, uh, micro perspective versus an institutional one. Hey everybody, I think um, for me, it has been, um, I can't say that I have been incredibly successful in any one particular area when that's, that's talked about, but I know the institutions that I would like to emulate um, are ones that have made that a priority at the very top level. Um, you know, as someone who does graphic design, as someone who does marketing, um, you can only do but so much. Um, you know, you, you, can, you can advertise any way you want, um, but if student, the student experience is not what you are promoting and what you're putting out, um, once they get to your campuses, um, then you're really doing yourself a disservice. And so I think um, for anybody who wants to do that successfully, the conversation has to start with top level admin. Um, it has to become a part of your strategic plan and it has to become a priority. Um, you know, otherwise you're, you're really sending images to students that may not speak of, of the actions that they receive when they get there. Um, you know, and that's really going to come back to bite you, uh, I think, in, in the future. Um, I'll go. Uh, UNC Greensboro is the most uh, diverse institution in the UNC system. Um, we are now categorized as an MSI, multi-racial serving institution. Um, I think we go, we, we go pretty much hard in the paint for recruiting minority students. Um, I can't speak for the faculty side. I've only taught one class in our design uh, area, um, but as an institution, um, we take that very seriously. Have to remember to unmute myself to have any have you seen any other schools that have like done a turnaround or been able to really uh, be, be successful at it so i from a an entire holistic institution perspective i cannot necessarily speak but um, my first eight years as a graphic designer i worked in the office of leadership and community engagement uh, at George Southern University and one of the one of the things that I noticed when I had first um, gotten hired into that position um, were the lack of was the lack of minority representation in their programs um, and then immediately right off the bat I noticed they weren't actively promoting um, you know almost all of their material um, was very um, you know all of the students and the, the one thing I noticed when I got there was their you know display banner that they took to all the recruitment events um, you know, it was it was four white students at the top of a banner in a suit and tie, um, and that didn't that didn't speak to the audiences that that they were hoping to attract. So it was changing the little things, um, but one of the things that I noticed made a big difference um, in the way that we recruited um, was changing some of the language that was used. Um, so for our particular programs, when I got there, it was heavily white and heavily female, um, and we. You know, and these are societal norms that a lot of us don't have control over. Um, you know, but a lot of the stuff that we talked about was service related. It was, um, you know, it was not project related, work related. And when we started to change some of that language, we noticed more um, more black males applying for our programs. Um, so it's not that they don't care about service. It's not that we don't care about service. That might not be the language that speaks to us the most. Um, they were very much more interested in in working together to complete projects, to complete work. Um, and when we started to change that language, we started to notice the difference um, in the interest in our program. Um, and that, that could be different depending upon what area of the country you're in. You know, we're in a small rural town in Southeast Georgia. So the language that we use may be very different um, from, from larger universities and urban settings. Um, you know, so you have, to, you, you have to always keep in mind your context. Um, but that's, that's one thing that has worked for us is really evaluating the language we use um, in our marketing materials. I have to keep remembering to, um, to unmute myself. <laughs> um, so this is, uh, 
I, I'm going to ask this next question. It's, but it seems it's difficult. Would you say you have cultural proficiency and awareness of the cultural and community norms of your student or student's body and provide equity and access in your instruction or marketing accordingly? Um, I've actually been thinking a lot about this question because there's a there's a lot buried in the language there. I mean, yeah. it, it, you know, what does cultural proficiency mean? And um, I, I can sort of get a sense of where the question is leading, but I think um, this this idea of an awareness of the culture and community or cultural and community norms, I think is really important to think about. Um, when I came to Cleveland State University, I was really the outsider in terms of understanding the, the, the student population, the culture of the program. I mean, I had an idea of what, that, what it would be like because I interviewed, um, but I think that being in the position now, I would say that the, the short answer is, is, do I have a sense? Yes and no. Um, yes, in the sense that I've, I've been at CSU long enough now that I, that I understand sort of the tenor of the dynamics in terms of the, the program culture and the way, you know, even the way faculty, we interact with each other, the way we interact with students. Um, but we're also pretty diverse in terms of the students that we work with. And so it's a, I would describe it as a, a process of continually learning or maybe even relearning um, how, um, I guess what, what these, what it is that students need and how I can help best facilitate those things. So there is no, obviously there's no cookie cutter, especially when it comes to educate, education. Um, but I think it's being open and thoughtful um, and aware of who, who our students are. And so I would say that, um, I guess I can just speak for myself in saying that I am very conscientious about the students coming into my classroom. I am interested in knowing kind of what their, a little bit about their background, um, understanding what their needs are and how I, again, how I can best support them. Um, but again, that's from a more of a, a, a micro level versus an institutional one. Uh, but I think it's, it's also a, a sort of a long-term um, project in terms of really understand, understanding who we're, we're serving. Um, I, I don't think it's, it's, it's hard to put college students in any kind of box to begin with, um, but I've been humbled in my experience in terms of, as I said, really learning and relearning as we get new students coming in, um, what those needs are and how we can best um, support and guide them. I don't know if anybody else has anything or Pierre, are you, are you able to, are you hearing us or can you, um, I see your box, but I don't know if you're able to participate or not. Uh, yes, I can, oh. hear, I can hear everybody now. Can you hear me? Yes. Super. Yay. Take <laughs> over. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe you can elaborate a little bit on that question or uh, that sort of that, that where you're going with that. Yeah, well, yeah, with the with the cultural proficiencies, um, it, it's difficult with incoming freshmen because you really have to learn about them, where they're from, their culture. Um, so, uh, as a as a uh, professor, you know, I I try to bring what's out in them just by asking questions on that first day um, to get an understanding. But like Anne was saying, it takes time over time, uh, you know probably the, the three or four years to finally discover who that person really is, you know, and then, you know, that senior year, you can pose more um, projects or something towards something that you feel that they're more interested in. I think in my case, um, so my previous office, I worked for campus activities and I would recruit um, student designers for work with us. And for a couple, when I first got there, you know, I asked the students, I said, so, you know, how do you get real world, real world experience, right? You do your projects for class, um, you may do things on the side, but how do you kind of grow your identity through what you do? Um, so I created something called Project Days, and I would give them like a certain theme, and then they would have like either color restrictions or font restrictions, but one of the projects that I gave them was social justice, right? And they were tasked with expressing themselves creatively, graphically, without using words. 
And from that project, I got to know the students. There were tears. I had people do <laughs> projects on um, immigration, um, the election, uh, toxic masculinity, and they were tasked with having to present themselves. Because, you know, I come from a, a variety of work areas, like advertising, you have to present your topic. So they would present them um, and they would have to speak and kind of talk about how they came up with their idea. So I think as far as like providing access, um, I had a minority, um, I'm sorry, I had a multiracial, I guess you could say group. I had students from Korea, um, Black African students. Um, and so I think it brought a different perspective as far as giving them the space to be authentic and giving them a space to maybe um, speak to their craft, which in normal classes, they may not have the available or the, the availability to do. So, so and how, how do, how did you approach that, getting to know your students? So this is an, an exercise that I've been doing for a number of years now. Um, and that is, especially with students that I've never had in class before, and it's actually a written at least partly a written exercise. And it's, there, there are three sections to it. The one is sort of a general about you. One section is about what is your relationship with the institution, like, um, and in terms of like, you know, are you familiar with campus? Um, why did you choose this particular institution? Like, how do you, how do you feel, that, is a, how do you feel you fit at this particular institution? Um, and then there's a section on um, what kind of their goals and aspirations are for themselves. You know, do they really want to pursue design or they, do they have other interests? And so part of this written project, well, there, there's a written piece and then they're to bring in some sort of visual artifact that reflects, I mean, it could be a, something that they produce themselves. It could be um, something, you know, a, a, a collage of, of images or work that inspires them. It can be whatever they want it to be. Um, and then we, this, so that I usually introduce that the first day of class and then the second day of class, we spend some time actually talking about um, some of their responses. And I leave it really open in terms of um, the written piece, like they can write whatever they want. I, I'm the only one who reads these. Um, I mean, we, we talk about some of the written pieces in class together, but if there are things that they want, feel comfortable disclosing to me that are private, um, I encourage them to do that. But it's, um, I, I find that sometimes I'm, I don't want to say terrified. I'm, it's not that I'm terrified of students, but it, it's definitely this sort of awkward relationship on day one when we don't know each other. And it's just as much about me learning about them as hopefully they're learning about me and also their, their classmates um, and feeling, you know, developing some initial sense of connection. But, but I would hope that it's also provides them with an opportunity to share a little bit about themselves outside of like design specifically. So uh, I'm gonna pose this question to Justin. Um, so when you're uh, getting work, is any of your work um, related to that, learning a, a different culture or um, trying to understand um, from a project that is given, given to you? Um, to be transparent, um, it's hard um, to get work out of your background um, in this arena, especially um, I went to Auburn University. Um, I was like probably the only African American um, in my program there. Um, and I will, and I will also say that I don't think that um, I know we're talking about higher education, but I think that the journey of all of this, the conversation also needs to be had at a secondary education level, high school level, because even when I was in high school, um, the focus in my particular high school was sports. And I think that that, that lane is taken um, in a lot of high schools with, 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 with minorities. Um, and so uh, the, the arts in any way wasn't a focus or it, you know, when I was, when I was in high school, the art elective, those kind of electives were afterthoughts. You just did those things to get a credit to move on. And there wasn't really enough focus to even hone in on students who had the, the, the gift and the ability to do those things. So then you're left with people who go to um, college or whatever, a technical institution and trying to learn and figure out what this is 
Um, so I, a lot of my um, higher education I spent trying to figure out what is this? I didn't even I wasn't I didn't even know what it is. I was never exposed to it. And so once you graduate, it's hard to even go out and venture out into um, jobs and careers outside of your 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 cultural background because the exposure is limited and there wasn't much focus and you you have to you have to try to figure out everything on your own. So I think that the conversation isn't solely left up to higher learning, but it's a conversation that needs to be held at the middle school level, the high school level, um, really exposing um, exposing the students to other things outside of the, I will say, stereotypical thing of sports and um, those particular things in, in, in those learning environments. Great answer. Great answer. I think 99% of us can relate to that. So, and that's perfectly, that'll lead into right into our next question for all of our panelists. So our question here is, were you mentored or inspired by anyone who came from a similar background as you? I'd say for me, um, so I had an uncle that was both a graphic designer and freelance designer because he, I learned very, you know, very soon you can be an artist, but you need something that pays the bills, right? <laughs> so I would watch him do, he worked for um, a publishing house at, anybody remember the apartment guidebooks that you could get at the grocery store? Um, he worked there and I would see him. I didn't really, I'm like Justin, I didn't really know exactly that it was an actual field, like our career days or bring your, uh, I don't know, your aspiring career to work. There's never a designer there. But I knew that I had a, a love for design. I've always been like that. And I think that propelled me to do and to maybe go a little harder. My school did not have a typical design program. I mean, my, my major um, was graphic communication and technological studies. So, you know, design has all these facets. You have advertising, you have graphic design, you have all these different spaces. Um, but you kind of don't know which one to go through, go to. And so when you, like Justin, when you get out into the field, you know, one, you have no one guiding you. So you're literally trudging your path as you go. Right. So I would meet people and say, oh my God, what do you do? What school did you go to? I learned about the portfolio center. That's a school down in Atlanta. I learned about the creative set, the creative circus, I think it's called. It's another design school. I learned about um, the VCU ad center. So all these different design schools, one, I didn't know existed. Um, they did not, I don't know how they do their recruitment, but I remember I applied to one, didn't get in. Um, they had like, they would have like 6,000 applicants and only get 60. So I think that gave me something to want to subscribe to, but you get to learn your competition, I guess you could say. If you're a freelance designer and you've got someone that's went to an actual design school, your, the competition is set up a little different. So I think in having an uncle that was in both, in both worlds, I guess, I learned um, kind of how to, what best you can say it, I learned the need for both, but it also taught me to strive for both. As a designer, I want to get my name out there, I want to be a freelance person, but on a, I guess you could say a corporate or education or whatever, I guess, uh, avenue you're going into, I also had to learn that field as well. Um, so I think mentorship is huge. Um, students that I've met, um, with just working in our offices, they go to class. There's no one that pushes them. Um, going to an HBCU didn't have a, a, a design program, I guess you could say. Um, oh, and my professors were not designers. They were people, different, uh, different majors, different degrees that were given a book and say, hey, can you teach Photoshop? Or hey, can you teach this class? Um, there was really no concepting in it. So from that, I had to go because I wanted to do, I wanted to do what I love. I had to, you know, take a couple more steps. So I remember I needed an internship and I literally opened the phone book, started with the A's. I said, hi, my name is Ashley Hill. I'm trying to get uh, more experience in advertising. Will you hire me? I'll work for free. And to me, that was probably the best education I got um, just because, I mean, I was this, this student wanting to learn. So I, if, when I didn't have a mentor, I went and found them. Um, and I wouldn't say um, I maintain relationships to those people um, right now, but I understand the kind of, I guess the push that they gave me, right? So definitely, definitely, we're talking about action items later. Um, I would, I don't know how to reach out, but I think there are suit designers that are looking, students of color, definitely looking for people to push them, to bring them into this area that from the outside, it may seem there's no clear path into. 
Sean, what, what are your thoughts? Um, I, I shared this story uh, with the panelists last week and um, I, to piggyback what, off what Ashley said, I think it's incredibly important um, for those of us that are in positions to, to be able to mentor students, to be seeking out those opportunities. Um, you know, even if you may, may not think that you have similar backgrounds, um, because I, I grew up in a very mixed family um, in a, a relatively affluent area um, of Atlanta. And the majority of my friends growing up um, were not like me. Um, and, and I'm realizing now that they were microaggressions, um, but these were still my friends growing up. And I'm learning that, that my experience was very different. You know, I was not, and these are their words, you know, white enough for white people or black enough for the black people or you know, I'm, I'm half Hispanic. My mom's Puerto Rican. I know enough Spanish to get me by, but <laughs> I'm not fluent um, and therefore didn't feel accepted by, you know, Spanish communities that were fluent in Spanish. Um, so I, I spent much of my, my childhood and even, you know, onto my, my college life trying to figure out where I fit in. Um, and that carried over as a designer as well, um, because I don't, I never felt like I developed my own style. Um, you know, I was constantly trying to emulate the work of other people. Um, and I think, I think having, having had the opportunity to have had someone to mentor me, um, I think they, they would have brought that out sooner. Um, they would have encouraged me to be my own person. Um, you know, it, it wasn't really until my sophomore year of college uh, in my graphic design program, like Justin, like you said, I'm, I thought about this for, for a good 30, 45 minutes earlier. I really do think I was the only person of color in my graphic design graduating class. Um, you know, and I was blessed enough to have um, a wonderful designer, O'Neilly O'Neilly um, at Georgia Southern, who's, um, who inspired me to start looking at my own work. Um, you know, he, I think he even said to me one day, you know, your work is good, but you're only producing what you think I want you to produce. Um, and it wasn't really coming from from my design, um, and so so I think it, I think it's critically important. A lot of these students desire that, um, and and are afraid to reach out to to their professors or people they know at the colleges. Um, so I think it, it doesn't hurt to start asking students, you know, giving that open invitation for anybody that wants to come talk to them um, about their design, about their experiences, um, especially especially at predominantly white institutions or or other places that may not have. Um, people of color that, that do design. Um, I think it's critically important. So I'm, I'm going to sort of piggyback off of, of the things that, that Sean and Ashley have said, like mentorship is hugely important. I, I will say that I feel like my career suffered from lack of mentorship early on. Um, and there are, but I, I would also say, I think there are varying levels of mentorship. I, I think of them as lifelines. So there are people who, who maybe they are sort of in and out of your life along the way, but they are kind of the, the, the piece that keeps you going, um, help you out in certain situations, even if it's not like a, a sort of a traditional mentorship relationship. Um, but I would also say to, to again, reference what, what Sean just said, um, part of the piece of this is that there's lack of representation in higher ed. So there are very few black faculty teaching graphic design specifically. And so one of the things I've been thinking more about is, um, you know, what, what is the gap there? So it's one thing to get into a design program as an undergrad and find your way, graduate, um, have the opportunities. I think Justin talked about some of this earlier as well. Um, but then what happens next? Um, is there encouragement to go beyond just undergraduate to do an MFA, um, to get a graduate degree to teach, because I think these, all of these things are connected, right? And so what would happen if there was more representation, people of color, black people specifically, teaching design in higher ed? How might that also impact um, the experience, not just of students of color, but of, of white students as well? Justin, as the, as the only, uh, owner of their own firm here. <laughs> what are your thoughts on mentoring and who were yours and did you have any? I absolutely piggyback everyone. Like I said, when I made the decision, I had no idea what graphic design was. I knew ever since I was, I was a, ever since I was a child, I had the gift of drawing. I could draw 
Um, I wasn't like other kids, like for Christmas and things like that. I didn't, I didn't want Tonka trucks. I didn't want, you know, trampolines and drum sets. I was the one asking my mom about me markers. I had every easel. So I knew that I could draw and I knew that I, I had the gift of drawing. So I, I sought out a school that I felt could help me cultivate that. And I chose Army University, got to the campus. I had no clue what design was. Um, I had a friend there who um, had was majoring in graphic design. And I so happened to walk into the building one day and looked on the walls and I was like blown away. Like, what is this? I didn't, I didn't know that this is what you called it. And I applied for um, the program, not knowing what typography was. I had to research it on my, on my own, not knowing what any of those things were. And I felt like, um, almost like a stranger when I got in courses and so many of my peers were like prepared and knew what the terms were and knew what the courses were. And I had to go and like learn and research. Um, so I feel like, um, what everyone has said, there is poor representation. I can't stress this enough, not just in higher education, but there is poor representation of it in high schools. Like no one at my high school had the ability to steer me or give me clear information, um, as to what this was or how to even, you know, explore other things beyond, you know, it's just so happened that I took the art elective um, every year in high school because I was so enamored with drawing. Um, and most of the, the kids that were in the class with me, like, they didn't take it serious. It was literally like, this is my elective to graduate. And I was like one of the few who like had a passion for it and who would want to stay after school and learn how to cultivate it. And so I, I don't think that it's taken serious enough as other things are personally, where you would see, where you would see schools invest so much money into the basketball teams, <laughs> the football teams, and there's not really representation um, for the arts. You know, I, I'm so I think that, and so if I, I feel like that I would have been better equipped if I had been exposed even on a high school level before I even ventured off into my collegiate, um, you know, education career. So I, it, it, I absolutely agree. And even when I got in college, there was no encouragement of you should go and learn and come back and, and teach. Um, it was basically like you just go. Um, now, I will say that Auburn, um, it, it prepared me for the world. We had um, exposure to internships. Um, we had access to companies like Iconologic and um, different, different design firms um, all over the country. Um, but there really wasn't a push or a motivation to come back and to let our face be seen. Um, and I think that's part of what the gap is with not seeing minorities teaching because um, it all goes back to the representation before college. If I am not exposed to it on that level, then I have no passion to do it even further than when I get out of college. So I think that that conversation needs to, we can have these types of conversations and I, and I absolutely agree that they're necessary on this level, but there has to be a unity and a bridge between um, the collegiate level and the high school level so that we're making sure that when students do go to college and choose this, this, this particular, it's just like when you have English classes, we took AP English in high school to prepare us for the procedures of English in college. So I think that those kind of programs need to be in place so that like for me, I felt like I was just like a walking nomad when I got into the program because I literally not only had to soak in the information that my professors were giving me, I had to also um, be my bridge for learning those things that I should have known when I got into school. So. So now we're all professionals. We went through our collegiate um, times and all that, getting our uh, graduate degrees and all that. If I would ask you, I, well, I'm going to ask you now, who inspires you now or who do you see as a mentor in your career right now? Anybody? Go ahead, Ann. <laughs> um, I would say, so this is like a, a, a complex, multi-layered uh, <laughs> question for me. Um, certainly my colleagues, I think of them as my mentors because they have mentored me. They recruited me. Um, they have mentored me every step of the way. And, and that's really important and really powerful. Um, I am the only Black person in the department. And so um, I think it's, it's just reflective of how intentional the efforts are to create a community, a collaborative community, 
um, that I'm a part of. And so it, it's, um, so I feel mentored by my colleagues is the, the first part of the, my response. Um, and the second part is, um, is actually the community of black designers that I've met within the last, even the last five years. I didn't know any black designers until I was well into teaching. Um, the only black professor I had was my dad because he, he taught um, African-American history, public policy. So I, I had him for, ironically, an African-American history class, <laughs> but he was the only black professor I ever had. Um, so, and I, as I said, I didn't know any black designers until I, I was well into teaching. Um, and so it's only been within the last four or five, six years that I've started to meet other black academics specifically um, in my circles. And so I see that as a kind of collective mentorship, if that makes sense. Um, so it's not a necessarily a single person because there have been lots of people along my particular path and journey. Um, but I view it as more of a, a, a collective of individuals who have, who continue to inspire me. Um, and I'll just name a few people. Um, I think Kelly Walters might be on this call. I, she might be surprised. I think of her as a kind of mentor. Um, Audrey Bennett at University of Michigan. I mean, I, there are just many. I don't want to get in trouble for forgetting <laughs> somebody, but those are, those are two names that stand out in particular. Um, Penny Achayo, I will, will just um, throw her name out there as well. She, she was actually a former student of mine, um, but she's teaching at Wash U. And so it's like, it's about the long-term relationships and, and people who um, are part of this larger collective and helping to support you. Ashley. Um, I'd say I'm still on the hunt um, for mentors. Um, I have, this is a great space for me. I don't know many, maybe one or two um, black designers or minority designers. Um, so my sister is an artist. She's a fine artist. She's probably the one that inspires me the most. Um, I think oftentimes, you know, when you are a student, whether you're as K-12 or higher ed, um, being a designer can be seen as a, as a profession that doesn't pay a lot, right? So you don't see a lot of people that are doing it um, because those aren't people that are put in front of you. Um, so I said that to say, yes, I'm still looking for mentors. I think I will always be a student. Um, just because I think there's always room to grow. Sean? I, it's funny, I, I, I cannot pinpoint one particular person, very similar to Anne, there's so many people that have influence in my life right now. Um, you know, from, from my direct supervisor to, um, you know, the PR person at the college I came from, you know, I, I work for a small technical school, so um, thankfully, we are not in the news as much as our partners across the street are because we, you know, we're a school of 1500 students. They've got 27,000, you know, but, but the PR person over there, I'm calling constantly because they have to deal with so much more than I do. Um, you know, so their, their wisdom is just so valuable. Um, but shameless plug for UCDA here. Um, I, I am reminded every time I go to a UCDA conference of how important mentorship is because I have so many genuinely, um, just powerful conversations with other designers while I'm at those conferences that I'm like, man, I need this in my daily life. Like I need to have these people that I can talk to on a regular basis. Um, you know, and I'm reminded of that every time I go to one of these conferences and, and just have these discussions and realize like, I'm not the only one dealing with these things. Um, you know, there are designers across the nation, across the world that, that have these same problems or, or are dealing with the same issues, um, you know, and, and really just, uh, it's just so good. Um, so I'm going to stop there because I'll talk forever. Uh, but that's that's kind of where I stand out here. Thank you. You're welcome. Justin. Um, I would say my mentor um, currently at the moment um, is Derek Blank. Um, I had the opportunity to meet him um, in my field about six years ago. Um, so there's not there's not a lot of out there and so i've actually in my own personal business tried to make it an endeavor to offer myself as a mentor um to other graphic designers that are coming up because i understand it's hard i come from a background um not only do you have to deal with um school but life 
I come from, you know, my mother was on social security, my father was on social security. So beyond the support on an educational level, I needed somebody to help me maneuver on a life level as well in combination. So I've made it um, a personal endeavor of mine to avail myself to um, peers um, using my platform and those who follow me um, to open myself up as a mentor and offer programs underneath my company that allows um, upcoming graphic designers to get the support and the encouragement, the push and the exposure um, that they need. Um, I've been hosting classes and in the teachings that I've been doing from my company, making sure that upcoming designers, whether you are from the ages of 10 to 17, that you are equipped and you know um, the educational part of the work. It's like, you know, it's so much knowing the, um, the correct terminology and knowing um, those things before. I have so, I, you know, I have so many um, high school students that take some of my classes and trying to make sure that they are prepared if they choose to do it at a higher level, then they're not slighted or feel like they're unprepared to really go into it. So, um, yeah. Yeah, I, I totally understand where everybody's coming from. Myself, I was, I didn't find mentors until late in my career and I got into education. I did professional design earlier and until I got into education, I, I really didn't have any designers and, or any mentors until then. So I totally agree. So with, with, with that said, with all this newfound knowledge that we have of designers of color, right? How does this affect your identity as an educator, designer, or professional within your profession, guys? Is well, I... I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, go. No. Oh, okay. So <laughs> I... I um, well, I think um, for me, uh, there was a lot of time spent feeling like the only one, like I was the one, the only one. And you sort of get comfortable in a weird way with that, being the only one. Um, and what I would say has changed now for me personally is that um, even though I'm still the only one in some spaces and contexts, again, I'll refer to the collective, like knowing that there are more people out there having these conversations is, is really um, helpful in me thinking about myself as part of that collective, right? I'm not alone alone anymore. Um, and so, and, but, but also the recognition that there's so much that I, so much more that I have to learn yet as well. Um, so but for, for me, it's, it has changed it in a good way, right? That it's, it's uh, feeling a sense of, of community, even through these panels, like the one we're having right now. Ashley? I was gonna say, she, she basically answered it, I agree. Um, I think finding spaces like this um, amongst people that do what you do and love what they do as well, um, that shapes that. So I'd say this newfound knowledge is, I'm still being shaped. Um, so again, you know, to echo, very, very, very grateful for this space. All right, Sean or Justin, which, I, which either one wanna go first? Go ahead, Sean. Sorry, I missed, my, I missed my mute button. Um, I think, you know, as I explained earlier, I am I'm just now coming to a place that I'm really discovering my identity, um, you know, as, as a designer. You know, I, I graduated college, well, I can't do the math off the top of my head, but you know, <laughs> a decade ago. Um, and from the time I graduated until now, I, I really have been producing work that that other people have wanted, you know, and, and a lot of times that happens in higher education. You have to work within the context that you're given. You've got design standards, you've got, you know, templates, colors, et cetera. Um, you know, but coming here, you know, working at Ogeechee Technical College has been refreshing. Um, you know, we have a, an incredible art director um, and the, everything that college puts out has really taken on her identity. She's the art director for the college. She designs everything. And to some extent, yes, you still have to work within your bounds, but um, the stuff we put out is is her. It's you know it's her identity. It's it's the stuff that she she really works on, um, and it has inspired me to realize that just because I work in higher education doesn't mean my style isn't important. Doesn't mean that my style is not valuable to the college. Um, you know, not everybody may like it, 
Um, not everybody may, it may not be their, you know, their aesthetic, but, um, but really, I'm really looking forward to exploring that, I think, in the next, in, you know, the next couple of years. Um, hopefully having more conversations like this with other people too, um, you know, kind of being the influencing factor to that. Justin, any thoughts? Um, I would say that I am extremely grateful for the conversations that the pandemic has caused to arise. I think I was having a conversation with someone the other day. I think that in the world, um, what we do for so long has been for people on the outside looking in has been like a afterthought or has not been taken seriously. And this pandemic has actually shined a light on creatives and designers and people who flow in this field and let it, let it be known that we have a, we have a voice, um, we have a place here and that what we do is needed. It's a necessity for what we're going through. I can speak for myself and my business and say that during the pandemic, um, business didn't slow up for me. It actually almost doubled. And so that gave me language to speak to know that we are needed. Um, and it even give, it encourages me to speak to other designers and let them know. Because to be honest, I was like, you know, kind of shamed growing up with my major. All of my friends were majoring in law and being doctors and teachers. And here I am, got a, they're like, what are you going to school for? And I'm like, graphic design. And so, but now I think that a level of honor has come with it now. And it's come because of the conversation that has been, um, had to be had because of this pandemic. So I'm grateful. It is so refreshing to have these types of conversations because they've been, they've been silent and swept under the rug for so long. So I am honored to be here. I am on, and I'm so grateful for this platform. I'm so grateful for this committee for allowing a conversation like this to be had because I think that these type of conversations really um, kind of open up um, so much for not just people of color, but for the world. Um, and it takes the blinders off of the world and allows um, what we do to be seen in a different light. And I'm just so encouraged to know that these conversations are still being had. Um, so I'm just, I'm so grateful um, for all of you all and I'm grateful to be here. Great, great. Um, so a, a second part to this, and I'm gonna pose this to you first, Anne, and everybody else can uh, tag in after that. So with this new introduction of inclusion of designers of color and their aesthetics, um, do you think their aesthetics will have an impact on the next generation of designers and their identities and the outputs that were, I mean, I'm an educator as well, and their outputs that they're producing right now? I, I think so, and I hope so, and I, I hope more educators encourage it, or, or even if it's not necessarily being encouraged, that stu I mean, I think students have access now in ways that I didn't when I was a student. So they can get access to these, these you know, video recordings of these panels that we're doing. Um, so in a way, they, they just have greater access to some of the things that we're talking about than, than probably, than I had, and, and maybe some of the others of you can identify with that as well. Um, but I, it's been a sin of omission in the design world. Like I, I, I've shared the story before, but when I read um, the Fast Company piece about W.E.B. Du Bois and how he had created these infographics, I was furious. I was so angry in the sense that why didn't I know about this before? Why didn't somebody tell me? Um, and Pierre, I remember seeing your presentation at a UCDA conference, I believe, where you were talking about all these um, black designers. And there were some names that I had heard nothing about. So it was a, it was, I was angry, but it was also um, a recognition that, yes, we absolutely, it is my responsibility as an educator to think about these, the, the way I teach differently, um, to reshape the curriculum, um, to be more expansive in how I approach design education in that respect. So I, I think I answered your question somewhere in there, but I, yeah, I think <laughs> I think they just students have greater access and we as as educators should help them if we're not directly providing the information to them. I mean, we should we should be helping to facilitate, certainly. Mm. Um, I mean, it's out there now. It's not can't put the toothpaste back in the tube like these things are not going away. Exactly, exactly. Uh, does anybody else have any thoughts on that? No. Okay. All right. So we'll just move on to the next question. We have like uh, 
eight minutes here left. Um, so we'll just try to sum it up real quick here with this last question. Looking back, and, and some of you have probably answered this a little bit already, what would you say were some of the gaps in your design education? Obviously, history is the biggest one, <laughs> and that's from me, from me. Anybody else have anything? And history, for sure. I think for, for me, and it was access to technology. Um, I, like many of you have already said, I didn't know what graphic design was till I got to college. I just assumed every artist did creative, you know, did, you know, colored, used markers and, and paint. Um, you know, I, it didn't occur to me that, that art is, is also a digital form, um, you know, regardless of all the stuff that I'd see, you know, I'd, somebody had to do it. Um, you know, but for me, it was access. Um, you know, when I started my graphic design program, and I think Justin kind of shared some of these similar sentiments, I didn't know what Illustrator was. I didn't know what InDesign was. As a matter of fact, in my college program, we almost worked purely in Photoshop and Illustrator. And so when somebody sent me stuff from InDesign, once I graduated, I was like, wait, what is this other program that I signed up <laughs> the last four years? Um, but, you know, access is becoming more available, you know, in our local libraries and things like that, that I think will are really going to make a significant impact um, in the number of minorities that have that have at least some knowledge of design, digital design before they get, um, you know, to higher education. Um, and I think that's going to make a huge difference moving forward um, is the access to that. Yeah. I'd agree with that. Actually, I'd go, I'd go access and awareness. Um, I was working in PageMaker when I first started college. I don't even think PageMaker is a thing anymore. Um, but, you know, my first program was PowerPoint. I went to go see um, Love and Basketball 25 years ago. And, uh, and that was my first poster in Photoshop. So <laughs> I wish um, that I knew more about, you know, Black designers. Of course, I mean, I am so grateful for this space because, I mean, this brings about an awareness that I probably wouldn't have been able to engage in if it wasn't for the pandemic, just speaking back to what Justin said. So I think definitely awareness. Um, I wish I knew pe more people back then than I know now. Um, but yeah, I think the game changes from here because we have this space and now we have this, you know, opportunity to do something different for the ones coming up. Do you have anything, Justin? Any thoughts on that? No, not at this point. Okay, uh, no problem. Um, so with that, did you think any of you had any to conform to anything um, during these times that you missed these gaps to get your foot in the door to get ahead? Well, I, I will just say, I, I think mentorship really is the foundational key in all of this. I, I feel like mentorship is the, the, the thing that helps, even if there are gaps, which we can't avoid altogether, but mentorship is the thing that, that helps fill those gaps in. I mean, there's so much of what all the other panelists have said that I can identify with. And there was a lot, it took me a long time as well to kind of get to where I am now. Um, so lots of gaps, mentorship helped fill some of those. So I think, I think maybe that's part of the key. It's not even necessarily, um, a, a, I mean, learning how to use the tools of design is really important, but I think that equally important is having people who can help you, who, who identify, hey, I see that you're struggling. Is there some way, you know, can we, how can I help you? How can I support the work that you're trying to do? You know, like, like re actually reaching out to people um, to figure out how to support what people are trying, because I see, you know, when I see a student who's struggling, that's my inclination. I would like to help that student, right? To help fill some of these gaps. Mm -hmm. um, but I think on a, on a larger scale, um, we need to think about as a profession, what our collective effort is in terms of help. Like, like Justin, you've got me over here. I'm thinking you need to come talk to my students. Uh, I'm, <laughs> I'm just feeling you there. Um, but, you know, I, I think it's helpful for students to hear some of these stories as well. Um, so I think that's part of it. I don't know, I'm rambling at this point, but I, I just think there, there are really a lot of great nuggets of things that we've pulled out during this discussion. Mm -hmm. um, and I think even just having this panel is one of the ways we help fill the gaps. Yeah, so, I mean, Gina, Chris, and Amanda, I mean, maybe you guys can think about something with UCDA 
to have a list of people that would volunteer mentor and meet with students via Zoom or something. Um, I'll speak for myself. You know, if anybody out there, especially um, high school educators of art, if you need somebody to reach out, I I'm willing. Just contact me. I can set up a Zoom meeting with your classroom or a specific student in need. And by mentoring, I mean, I know we're focusing on the Black artists now and designers, but we can also remember there's religion, different cultures um, to um, help mentor. Um, gender issues, you know, mentors for gender. I, I think that'd be a great idea. Yeah, I think, go ahead, Justin. And I also think, um, I know for me, um, to piggyback on your question was, um, I had to create my own door. After college, I had to create my own door. I remember graduating from college and I know I went on every bit of 50 interviews after I got out of college. And everybody told me the same thing. You have an amazing portfolio. You are, you are an amazing graphic designer, but you have no experience. And so after hearing that for so long, and when I say so long, I mean for about 16 months, I had to make the decision, well, you know what? I gotta make my own door and I am gonna have to create my own level of success. So I think that mentorship, there needs to be some level of mentorship even after you leave um, higher education. What, what do I do next? How do I, how do I, you know, we, we talk about like opportunities. How do I get an opportunity? Like how do you, you, you tell me to go to college, get a degree um, in this field, but what do I do next when people tell me no, because they want to see something else from me. So I think that there needs to also be, you know, some form of mentorship beyond um, the degree because it's, it's a beast out here. You know, you're, you're, you're walking into these different companies and I interviewed not with like, I've interviewed with, I remember having a four step interview process with Delta Airlines here in Atlanta, Georgia. They brought me in. I did two rounds of Zoom interviews, came in, did an in-person interview, had to come back and do a interview where they sat me in a room, gave me a concept, had me to draw for two hours and pitch an idea to them. And they literally called me back to say, you were amazing, but we would just like to see more experience. And so I'm fresh out of college. I'm like, how can I, <laughs> what experience can I show when I'm, I'm just, but you know, so for, for students, um, not even just um, students of color, but students in general, that's hard to hear. And it's hard to maneuver through that season. So I feel like um, there needs to even be a level of mentorship for students after they graduate. And I think, I mean, to add to this point, we've got to encourage students to do work, like do things. I think a lot of times, especially with students I interviewed, they would show me their school projects. And my thing was do work. If it's a wedding, if it's anything, p create your portfolio. And then when they go to interviews, they have something to show other than, you know, what they've done for the last five projects. And then also to teach them how to present themselves. You know, I'm a, most of my creative students, they just know work. They don't know how to talk and speak like they have something to say. So I think as a maybe a career kind of thing inside UCDA that teach, you know, that you can grow your skill set, but also grow your soft skills. Can you talk? Can you interview? How does your resume look? You know, if you're a designer and you're handing a resume that you've done in Word, you know, does that speak to you? So bring that identity to, into your work, but also in how you present yourself. Wonderful, wonderful. Absolutely. I think that that's, that mentorship piece is something we've talked about a lot is how can we, you know, because especially with, you know, when we have conferences and that type of thing, people can like network and stuff like that. But and as we have had to, you know, uh, become more of a virtual environment, figure out how can we continue to keep those connections going without having in person. So I think that's even more important than ever right now. So I think that that's a conversation that we'll continue to have and try to you know, get something more formal, I believe. But um, I know, Pierre, I don't know if you have any uh, last notes, but just want to let you know, we put a um, evaluation in the, um, in the chat and also just keep an eye on future events. We're continuing to try to add, because obviously this is a short conversation today, but we want, this is a longer conversation um, that we'll continue to try to have. And um, our annual design conference is, is coming up in October. Um, and that will be virtual this year. Um, and, but um, some of these types of conversations will hopefully continue to be had at the conference as well. Yeah, I think the only th other thing I wanna say, if anybody else out there has any research or archival websites um, about black American design, 
please share them in the chat window and um, we can share those. The information about panelists and uh, for now, I mean, for this one and the first one, there's information up on the UCDA website if you want to look at their work, um, have students look at their work and, and what they're doing at this time. And I want to say just continue the conversation. I want to thank UCDA for keeping this conversation going, uh, most of all. And for all your educators, once again, welcome Black designers and professionals to speak at your college or university. I'm willing to do it. I'm sure our panelists would do it, especially with this whole Zoom thing now. Everybody's getting used to it. We can Zoom into a classroom and make it easy. Um, and that's, that's it on my end. I enjoyed this very, very much. Again, thank you again, Gina, Chris, Amanda, Tadson, for letting me moderate this conversation. Uh, I, I love it. And like I said, let's keep it going. Yeah, thank you all for being here today. Goodbye, everyone. Hey, Gina. Yeah, I have a quick question for you. Yes. Um, there is a whole lot of great, great uh, links and things in the panel. I mean, in the chat. Yes. Is there, are those, will those links be listed and maybe categorized or somewhere we can um, access those? Well, we will post the whole chat. Okay. In the chat, so if you look at the one from last time. Okay. Um, we will, um, post like I'll show you what it looks like um, I'll show it to you in here I'll just type it in here so there's the chat that has everything but it, it's it's kind of everything so I think one of the things we thought about is yeah going through there and kind of pulling out some of those links to maybe put on more of a, um, a resources a resources page so you don't have to maybe sift through some of the um, other stuff that maybe might not be as helpful okay Thank yeah you. I enjoyed, I wish it was longer. I wish <laughs> I have a I group for, just a group for, a, you know, a group for a minority designers, just like a collective. Yeah. I think that would be so, this is so refreshing. Mm -hmm. And I think the first one was an hour and a half and I was like, was that too long? Do people get that Zoom fatigue? But then it's like, maybe it needs to be an hour and a half. So I was just kind of like trying to find that balance of the right, the right time. I saw a couple comments in there. People wish it could be a little longer. Yeah, so it's just like, you know, maybe it should have been longer, but it's just, also it seems like, you know, sometimes people are busy and so they only can, you know, tune in for an hour depending on their schedule, so. Yeah, yeah. But. Sorry for the technical difficulty at the beginning. I, that's okay, my background went out. I like got signed out of Zoom, like at the very, I'm like, what is uh, happening? What, how did, why did I, so. And I was worried if I signed back in, it would kick me out. And I was just like, I don't want to do that. So. I, I had it on two different computers at one time, trying to get the sound to go. And I'll, it just popped in all of a sudden. I, I don't know what it was. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, it is one it, of those things that, it and it always seems to happen at like, you know, and then you're just like, okay, I have to yeah. figure this. <laughs> so. Yeah, I, you think 15 minutes is long enough, but <laughs> obviously it's not. <laughs> yeah. But w once again, it was a pleasure. No, it was good, you know, good. Tats and I were chatting like we, you know, we should always make sure that we have like a back, somebody backed up so they can kind of be prepared just in case. <laughs> I was thinking, did, I was thinking, did, did, Gina, did Gina print out or does she have I did, I printed it out, but then I'm like, I can't speak, you know, as eloquently as, as Pierre, but oh, I'll my best. No, no, no. <laughs> no. All right. Well, thank you again. Everyone. Thank you all. Yeah. Thanks. Goodbye. Bye, guys. Take care.